cost us five billion dollars. It cost them 75,000 lives. It was one of the bloodiest battlegrounds of the Cold War. This weekend, all of that may become history. While we have been transfixed by the alleged cannibalism of Jeffrey Dahmer, the sexual appetites of sometime heavyweight boxing champion Mike Tyson, and the always popular question of whether marital fidelity is a necessary quality in a presidential candidate, a war is about to end. It was one of those regional conflicts that we seemed ready to accept as the permanent background music to the central drama of the Cold War. We and the Soviets could never afford to engage directly. That would have been too bloody. But we would fight forever, or so it seemed, through our surrogates in Afghanistan, in the Middle East, and of course, in Central America. On Saturday, in the capital of El Salvador, that country's 12-year-old civil war will come to an end with the start of a formal ceasefire. And once more, everybody seems to think it's going to work. How's that for a little piece of good news that we've barely bothered to notice? Here's more from correspondent John Martin. El Salvador is already starting to rebuild from the ravages of war. On a main highway, workers are reconstructing an overpass. In the capital, bricklayers are building houses. In the shopping streets, people are walking out in the sunlight, convinced, for now, that the violence is behind them. What lies ahead, however, may be the toughest part of all. The central government has to deal with the grinding poverty that made people in the countryside willing to sympathize with the rebels. The government has to rebuild the roads and bridges and services and extend them to parts of the country that have never gotten help before. Lionel Gomez is a social philosopher who went into exile after surviving eight assassination attempts by the death squads. Salvadorans have already begun to change their country, he says, but there isn't much time. The only thing that hasn't changed is the three and a half million people that we have in this country that earn less than a hundred dollars a year. That's the real task. And I'm not saying that we should solve the problems overnight, but what we have to do overnight is give these people real hope that change is taking place. Change brings the hope that the flow of Salvadorans to the United States may finally be reversed, but not yet. Each day at the U.S. Embassy, hundreds of Salvadoran emigres return and line up for visas that permit them to continue living abroad. So you're, you're not planning to move your family back here from Los Angeles? Not for a while. Not for a while. Now that the war is ending, have you been giving any thought to moving home? Here? No. Why not? I don't like it here. I'm used to over there. Over there is the United States, where as many as a million Salvadorans live in exile, a fifth of the population. What they fled was a battleground that claimed 75,000 lives, including those of at least 27 American soldiers and civilians. The fighting was sustained by the two superpowers, the Soviet Union, which supplied the rebels, and the United States, which backed the government. The total cost to American taxpayers, $5 billion in military and civilian aid. A new study for the Pentagon says the United States policy was based on false assumptions and did not achieve its goals. It's a failure. Uh, we didn't want uh, a mediated solution, a negotiated solution. We wanted the, uh, the uh, Salvadoran regime to triumph over the guerrillas. And we always said that the Salvadoran regime is going to have to change. But if they make these changes, they will win the support of the, uh, of the population and the support for the guerrillas will just uh, evaporate. Uh, we were never able to do that. Year after year, we was, uh, the, the military situation in El Salvador was essentially a stalemate. Mr. Ambassador, has it been worth the, the money the United States put in here, the lives that were lost here? It's never worth it when 50 or 60 or 70,000 people lose their lives. Uh, but if out of that comes something uh, better than what, what the country went into at the beginning, then at least you can say it was not uh, a sacrifice in vain. I think that it's time to look forward. 
if we want to see a new El Salvador uh, with prosperity, uh, with tranquility, uh, I think we have to have the courage to forgive and move forward. Salvadorans are trying to do that. The United Nations is helping. Patricia Weiss-Fagan is the mission chief helping relocate Salvadorans. The various groups within these communities are trying to say, if we have development, if we have reconciliation, if we have reconstruction, concretely, what kind of development do we want? It's a very hopeful session, this one, and so I hear much more hope than pain here. Even the rebel radio station is looking ahead. After years of reading communiques and Marxist analyses of the revolution, the station director says it has to make money. We are going to act as a legal station in the next few months, he says. We will seek to set up a participatory radio station where there will also be room for commercial advertising. The pain of reconciliation seems almost unbearable to many Salvadorans, but their weariness of war seems an almost equal emotion. So, with careful steps, the country is trying to put the war behind it. Solian Rivera is 57. She lost her husband and three sons. She keeps a picture of the youngest son, Santiago, who was 15 when he was killed. She also lost her home, burned to the ground by soldiers, she says. Rivera shows visitors the steel shaft of a bomb dropped on their village. She reminds everybody that United States taxpayers financed her misery. We want aid from the United States, she says, but not the kind of aid from the past, not more bombs to kill us. The United States should be willing to do as much in peace as it did in war, she says. That is a refrain heard from the rebels. They have asked that United States aid continue to help rebuild the country. Junior Akatado is 16. He has been a rebel soldier only a year, but is ready, he says, to begin a new life. I only finished the second grade, he says. There isn't much I can do. I want to continue learning. Once I learn how to read and write, then I don't have to live anymore by the machete. I would like to be a carpenter. And so the country that suffered so much is trying to build something new. Fortunate, perhaps, that unlike Northern Ireland or Yugoslavia, the hopes for peace now outweigh the fears of disaster. This is John Martin for Nightline in San Salvador. When we come back, we'll talk with the man in the studios, our Elliot Abrams, who was Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs from 1985 to 1989. And Robert White, the U.S. Ambassador to El Salvador in 1980 and 1981. And joining us from Mexico City, James Lemoyne, who reported on El Salvador for the New York Times during the 80s. He's now writing a book on El Salvador. We will focus in a moment on, on the miracle that seems to be about to take place in El Salvador. But Elliot Abrams, I, I would like to begin with you on your perception of how and why it is that we got to this point. <clears throat> well, the, the first thing that we tried to do uh, in the Reagan administration, I must say that they tried it at the end of the Carter administration, too, was stop the FMLN. The sine qua non was stop a communist military victory. And then the second thing that happened, and it took years and years after that, was the Cold War ended. I think it was the end of the Cold War that really allowed this, to use your term, miracle to take place. It was inconceivable five years ago. And if I ask you the same question, Ambassador White, uh, surely you would have to agree at least on the last part of what Mr. Abrams had to say. The end of the Cold War must have contributed. Well, I think that certainly the end of the Cold War uh, contributed in the sense that it changed our perception of El Salvador. But I think that uh, Nightline's introduction uh, tonight overemphasized uh, the surrogate quality of the revolutionaries in El Salvador. Uh, if ever there was an authentic revolution, it was, this, it was a revolution in El Salvador. And they have demonstrated uh, ever since 1988, at a minimum, when, when uh, the Soviet Union and Cuba went out of the revolutionary business to the extent that they were ever in it in Central America, and they launched their greatest offensive at the end of 1988. So I think that you had a homegrown, authentic revolution that we would have had to face uh, whether the Soviet Union or Cuba existed or not. Let me ask you then why you think that they stopped. If it was such a, a homegrown revolution and if they were such dedicated revolutionaries, 
They clearly have not achieved what they set out to achieve any more than it can be argued that the government achieved all that it set out to achieve. No, that, that's true. They, uh, they arrived at a negotiated solution simply because the war was deadlocked in a, in a stalemate, that there was no way that either side could change that stalemate. Now, the Salvadoran Revolutionary Movement calculated that they would never be allowed to win a military victory by the United States. Uh, and so they settled for uh, a negotiated revolution, as Alvaro de Soto of the uh, United Nations Mediator described it. But I think that, uh, that it's important to understand that the real reason that this war has stopped is that the United States Congress decided not to fund it anymore. Yep. And that was the primary uh, reason that the war, uh, that the negotiations succeeded. Jim Lemoyne, isn't that in a sense almost like begging the question? Because one could say that one of the reasons that the U.S. Congress stopped funding is it was no longer necessary to fight what indeed I did refer to at the beginning of this, of this program as a surrogate war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Yeah, I think in a sense everybody here is right. Uh, the Cold War did end and the U.S. Congress got tired of funding this war. But I would uh, agree with Ambassador White on this. Uh, this was a civil war. It wasn't a surrogate war. And the FMLN, uh, in these negotiations, won very deep changes in Salvadoran political uh, practices and culture. And it wouldn't have won them without the war. And American policy didn't win those changes. The war did. Well, I would disagree with that in this sense. Uh, American policy was first to stop the FMLN because the FMLN was not fighting, don't kid yourself, they were communists, they were not fighting for justice, they were not fighting for free elections, they were a communist group fighting for a Cuban style system in El Salvador. And no one who reads the materials they've been putting out for 10 years can doubt that. That was why we wanted to stop them. What they have won here is what the United States certainly would have been willing to grant 10 years ago, which was democracy. What the FMLN was asking for in the negotiations which took place with the late President Duarte in 1983-84 was not elections, it was that they would get ministries and that the FMLN would become part of the army. They have not gotten that, they have not shot their way into power, and in that sense our policy has been a great success. All right, gentlemen, if, if indeed this civil war can be brought to an end, as apparently it has, then perhaps we can also stop debating the past and make the transition into your assessment of what is likely to happen in the near and, and not so near future, which we will do when we continue our discussion in a moment.